Now, number 10, again, we're going to get into a very picky order here. I'm going to give number 10 to Ankh. Again, because Ankh is the third in the Eric Lang trilogy, because it is most recent, because we have not seen how it fares and how people are going to be talking about it five years from now, it's only going to be at number 10, although people make the argument that this is potentially a better game than Blood Rage and Rising Sun at a two-player or even the lower player counts than what you can make the argument for Blood Rage and Rising Sun, which really benefit and gain traction at the higher player counts. Again, different enough that you could own Rising Sun, Blood Rage, and Ankh all in the same collection and not feel that there's repetition, but also similar enough that if you're familiar with some of the others that you can play along with this and learn it relatively simply. There is more going on in this though. This is distinctly different with these areas and these seasons and even the merge mechanic at the end of the game to sort of help determine how many people are left and who's going to win which again is probably the most controversial mechanic and is the one that is going to be very interesting to see how it holds up over time and how interested people are again like five years from now with that mechanic or if they're going to be sick of it or not like it and that's going to be the other interesting aspect or are people going to adopt it and start using it in other games like this. I don't know. It's definitely not for me again as an area control person but again I respect the design. I respect the nature of this game and I respect the fact that it's probably a very very solid game it's just definitely not for me but that's why it's number 10. number nine i mean we're just going to go right next door we're just going right next door to rising sun again still very well thought of very liked in terms of the alliances and the actions and the maneuvers that you were making uh the <laughs> various uh creatures that you were going to be encountering and utilizing and the alliance system that gets you benefit from helping out others and being in line with other people. But again, sort of weird at the odd player count with the alliances. Still very miniature driven. Still can be a little bit swingy. Some of the monsters, again, you can make an argument that they maybe aren't the most balanced in some of these situations. But but still probably to be able to be argued as one of the most well-rounded Simon games that they have put out. And a lot of hype went into this one being the Blood Rage spiritual successor in the first place. I mean, and that's why it raised $4.2 million, and it's still relatively pricey on the secondary market with some of these exclusives if the time is right. So it's a beautiful looking game. It plays well, but it's also a longer game than Blood Rage in the first place. And so the overhead in this game is significantly increased. And again, it's probably not as wide appealing on the retail side of things for those reasons. But that's why it's number nine. Okay. Getting to the top eight right now. Getting to the nitty gritty. World of Smog, Rise of Moloch. Arguably the most underrated Simon game that they have put out. The one that has gotten the least attention. The one that has gotten the least support. There was actually less Kickstarter exclusives, but the majority of the expansions never made retail anyway. So the only place that people really were able to pick them up was that previously mentioned Time Machine. Again, a one versus all. It only raised 1.1 million, but it is this beautiful World of Smog steampunk adventure that just is an amazing, amazing setting and an amazing campaign style game going back and forth, utilizing the mechanism that was brought to you even further in the Masters of Eternia that I mentioned in terms of when the good guys do more, it gives the bad guys more power to do more on their side and to keep the balance on that side of things. Again, the exclusives are a little bit there, but it is just a tremendous game and unlike the others where it is purely tactical slugfest this is much more of a strategic balance thought-provoking style on both sides where there definitely is some slugging but it's very select and it's much more nuanced in how you're doing it and when you're choosing to do it to make it the most worthwhile because there is carryover from mission to mission um, again, you can see the one expansion was a little exclusive, but the rest of these never really got much wide retail release. And so, again, some games that, you know, people say that they wish would get released as a 2.0 version or a uh, second season, this is high up there on that side of things from people that play this game. Again, I would argue that this is one of my personal favorite Simon games, which is also why I'm biased and putting it up here at number eight, but that's okay because I think it's actually that good, and I think it deserves more attention than what it's got. Again, very unique system of how you play the one versus all, and honestly, just a lot of fun, even though, to be fair, the rules setup is a little bit more 
intense and a little bit more overhead than I'd prefer in a game like this as well. But that's why it's number eight. Number seven, Bloodborne. Bloodborne, one of the probable best video game adaptions we've seen in the last couple of years. Uh, Michael Chennault did a great job in this game. And the fact of the matter is uh, some people, again, either love it or hate it because it is very unique mechanistically. Because if you fail at a certain point, you have to go over and redo whole or part of the mission that you just spent a whole lot of time doing it. But it's brutal in that sense, just like the game is in the console and the PC side of things. And so it's replicating that. It's doing it in an easy enough way. And again, it's doing it in a much more translatable, easier to understand rule book overhead side of things than a lot of other stuff has of similar ilk. They do creative mechanisms in how you're utilizing the monsters and the games and the story-driven pathway of the campaign. And it just did a great job. Again, you can say that, you know, it's definitely hit or miss. People either love it or seem to totally dislike it. But again, as someone who'd had no attachment to the actual IP in the first place, I think it does a really good job of getting you a game that is still probably somewhat similar to the video game, but doesn't also make you just clamor for the video game in the first place instead, because there's too much going on on the tabletop side of things. So Bloodborne, number seven, much better than the card game as well. Number six, I mean, Blood Rage, the original. This was one of the staples, the pillars that sort of set Simon out in the first place as a company to be reckoned with. And especially when the Tom Vassell review came out as the pledge manager was opening, they had limited spots on the pledge manager on the late pledge, and it went and it went quickly. It only raised $900,000, but it probably has raised a ton more than that on the retail side of things, especially as I mentioned with a digital version, these exclusives were the first ones. And this was really one of the few games where they didn't have a ton of exclusives. There weren't a ton of add-ons and the exclusives were really just a couple of these promo monsters. And again, you can make the argument that these monsters were just not well balanced. They sort of broke the game in some ways and you were also better off. But this was also the one that we have seen that stood the test of time over the last five plus years that people are still thinking it's a good game. It's not just a Kickstarter fad and you can get a very good core game at retail without feel like you're getting half a game from a CMON Kickstarter in the first place. So that is why it's number six. Number five is going to be Marvel United. It's just a broad strokes, pandemic-esque, light co-op game with broad mass appeal that can be scaled difficulty-wise that's taking one of the best, most well-known IPs right when that IP is super hot and utilizing it to that extent. Again, too many exclusives, too many pledge locks, but also the fact that they did a lot of the heroes that were a little bit unconventional, super appealing, as well as the fact that they also had a lot of expansions, which take that for what you will, but the downside being that some of these expansions are just not all created equal. I love the villains. I love the fact that the villains seem to be actually thematic. The biggest problem being that the limited amount of actions on the hero side of things made some of these heroes feel very samey and not significantly powered well enough or just not unique enough in general. So when you look at these expansions, you go Infinity Gauntlet, great. Return of the Sinister Six, great different concept. Black Panther, Asgard, Galaxy, and Spider-Verse, kind of meh, to be honest. Kind of meh, truth be told, comparatively in terms of what they were offering, how they were being different, and the value from that side of things. And that seemed to be the relative consensus, not just my consensus, having played them all. But again, the broad mass appeal of this cannot be understated. To be able to play it with my five-year-old as well as my game group is something that we do not see enough of across the board as a recommendation when people ask for things like that. And so that is why it's number five. Now, number four is just along those lines, and that's just United. That's just X-Men United because they took this and they took the criticisms from Marvel United. They took the fact that some of the heroes weren't unique enough. They took the fact that some of the villains people wanted to play as and they gave us those options. They increased the variability in the locations, in how you're playing the cards and how, what you're going to be doing with those cards and the fact that heroes are going to have uh, something more unique about them, that some of the villains can be played as heroes or villains in these purple. Uh, again, I worry about some of the expansions. The Apocalypse expansion seems great. 
Uh, the pledge locking of some of these heroes kind of irritates me. Again, you had to get the all in to get, you know, old man Logan, for example. And so some of that I don't feel like is going to be quite the same. But they also went again. They went a little bit of everything, which surprised people because we saw Deadpool, we saw Fantastic Four, and we saw Days of Future Past with this huge freaking Sentinel as well. And so stuff we weren't expecting and stuff that really drove the FOMO, but stuff that also is broad mass appeal again as a better 2.0 version of the game, which also made me again frankly sell off a few of those expansions that i wasn't pleased with with the first one and get a few of these instead and i mean it shows because it raised just under six million dollars which is fantastic for a chibi cooperative pandemic s style game which you can now make a lot harder and play with both those groups that i said well that is why it is number four because i wouldn't be surprised if this is also not the last time we see something along this line of this mechanic and this core use of how they're playing so there you go number three um it's the pillar we're going with the pillars as the top three uh zombie sides 2.0 this is zombie side 2.0 3.4 million 21,000 people revamping zombie side from the ground up making it more streamlined making it better making it into everything that people wanted a little bit more out of in the first place three products in one there was an rpg there's a little bit of everything else but this is the one where they sort of said, okay, we're going to really give it an overhaul. We're going to make it that much better. We're going to give you a lot of the classic stuff just done a ton better. Here you go. Here's what you're interested in. Come and get it. And people did. So I've said enough about Zombie Side in this video. This is just arguably probably the next iteration that all of the future waves will be based upon, including the Undead and Alive that I mentioned in the first place. And that's 2.0. There you go brief and sweet number two arcadia quest if you couldn't have guessed it this was the one that sort of put them on the map again only three quarters of a million dollars but the skirmish game that a lot of people still hold in very high regard in how it plays even though again some of the characters are definitely not balanced it's just a lot of fun as a chaotic dice rolling take that style of game with a little bit of pvp as well as pve and again the uh expansion right here the guild master box still goes for like 300 dollars on the retail side of things because this was another one that uh you see what was it about four thousand just under five thousand people this is one that's never been available again and so this is one that people still clamor after as you know again a pure distilled version of arcadia quest that sometimes simpler is better i mean i'm not going to be the one that says that but i know that is the mass appeal to this one in general and why this one have found attraction and stays to have traction from that side of things but i mean again this was the one that sort of put them on the map on my radar but i think on a lot of other people's radar as well say what you want about the chibis and the art it did something different it did something unique that people are still trying to replicate in different ways nowadays so that's why it's number two number one in case you couldn't have figured it out in case you wouldn't have guessed this or maybe you didn't think it was going to be this high up this is cthulhu death may die this is probably the preeminent scenario based miniature dungeon crawl skirmish x game on the market and i say that with bias and i say that with opinion and i say that with just what i believe because it took the classic cthulhu it took the elder gods it took a dungeon crawl through objectives in it through bosses through enemies that you could very easily mix match go with a different setup go with a different terrain go with different heroes with a pressure luck with a i get damaged and i get stronger mechanism rolled it all into one and somehow made it into a heck of a lot of fun at the same time which is very very impressive i will say though this one was poo-pooed a lot while the campaign actually ran and that's why it only had 15,000 and 2.4 million because there was also the huge snafu of this with this pledge right here of this huge miniature which i still refuse to get because because i don't think it was worth it i still don't think it's worth it for the extra scenario and it's just an eyesore. It's an eyesore. It's this massive Cthulhu. I don't think it's worth it. No one can convince me otherwise. But because of what this game did, especially with the unspeakable box, with all these combinations of bosses and mini bosses and, you know, grunts, all of that stuff just made this game that much more impressive. The ability to mix and match and customize it the way you wanted makes it one of, like I said, the best games out there for what it is game that i can teach almost anyone at any level and you can have fun with it with dice rolling with a little bit of mitigation and 
it just is a solid, solid game that people are still picking up at retail. The biggest problem is that Unspeakable Box is just not available. The Unspeakable Box goes for like $250 or $300 alone on the secondary market nowadays. And it gives plenty of stuff and you wish some of that stuff was available, but you can still get a very relatively complete game with the core and season two uh, and not be too much worse for wear without it. And again, that seems to be the biggest component of these top three to four to five to six games is they've done well on Kickstarter, but you've seen them have more wide mass appeal in general. And again, it's a heck of a lot of fun. It's probably one of the most fun games in my collection, even when you lose. So that is why Cthulhu Death May Die is my best Simon Kickstarter to date. There you go. So... Totally, utterly, completely, objectively subjective. Argue in the comment section. Tell me why I'm wrong on all of my selections and why I should have things ranked much higher and much lower. You can tell me, ad nauseum, whatever you want. But that's my list. There you go. Hope that was interesting. Hope that will spark a little conversation. Let me know what you think. Let me know which ones I messed up on and which ones I got right. And we'll go from there. Thanks for watching. Thanks for clicking. If you want to see more, click the little subscribe and tune in. See you around. Stay classy. Uh, you know, again, striking while the strike is hot.